Day 3 of the St. Lopariers Breakthrough After an unexpectedly quiet night at Le Menil Hermann, we climbed aboard the tanks again and moved toward the rear over the very same road we had fought along coming into town the day before. At the first crossroad, we turned eastward toward some high ground. This maneuver puzzled me, as did most of our other movements during the day, but frontline junior officers rarely knew the picture beyond their own necessarily small operations maps. We came to some farm buildings off to our left, and my platoon was ordered to go out there and search them. We found no Germans, but did come across something interesting. We heard a wireless operator sending a message. The dit-dot of his signals carried loud and clear all over the farmyard. In the middle of the yard was a huge old dry well, and we easily traced the sound to there. I carefully peeked in, but could see nothing in the dark depths, even though the sound now almost jumped at me. I was not about to go blindly down that well or send anyone else, and since we had to move on quickly, we sent a message of our own. We dropped a grenade down the shaft. That ended all transmissions, though we had to rejoin our unit and never got a chance to check out the wireless gear. A short time later, as we got closer to the ridgeline ahead, we got off the tanks and went into positions along a hedgerow on the right side of the road. We waited there until the rest of the company caught up to us. I don't know what happened to Captain Holcomb, but Lieutenant Towis appeared to be in command of the company. My platoon went through the first hedgerow and into an open field beyond, with our tanks all around us. One of the tank captains was standing up in his turret, looking to our right front through his field glasses, when a German high-explosive, H.E. shell, whipped in and exploded just below the turret. The captain was killed instantly, and all of the tanks pulled back through the hedgerow to reorganize. The situation was now thoroughly confused, so we also went back to the hedge and awaited orders. During this interlude, we had our first psychiatric case, when one of my men lost control completely. His body began to shake violently, and he broke into loud sobs. This was a genuine medical emergency, and I just did not know how to cope with it, but realizing its frightening effect on the rest of the men, I had to do something quickly. So I simply turned the man over to the medic and told him to evacuate him immediately. It was too late, however, to keep the fear from spreading. My men looked sick, and they wouldn't look me in the eye. In a little while, we were ordered to try to cross the field again, but this time without the use of tanks. Not one of the men would volunteer to go out in front as the lead scout. I had to do something at once to get my men moving, so I stood in front of Private Fearson, a soldier I had noted before, and told him I'd promote him to sergeant on the spot if he'd lead one half of the platoon while I led the other. At this point, we were down to half strength, 19 out of the original 40, with no sergeants at all. I don't know why Sergeant Reed was gone. He was back with us a few days later and was wounded at St. Poix. Sergeant Anders was on special patrol duty at Battalion. He also rejoined the platoon before St. Poix. The private had no desire to take the lead, and he certainly didn't care about being a sergeant, but he finally agreed, so my new Sergeant Fearson took the lead on the left, close to a neighboring unit, and I took the right flank, which was completely open. We ventured out across the field in two columns about 100 yards apart, with no man directly behind another, and with ten yards between men. As we crossed the open field and I came to within ten yards of the next hedgerow, a German popped his head up, took a quick look, and ducked. I instantly hit the ground, quickly threw a grenade over the hedge, and then got up and ran forward to dive behind the base of the hedge for cover. My men quickly joined me on each side, and we all threw a few more grenades for good measure. Then I took a very cautious peek through the hedge and saw an apple orchard, about 50 yards wide and 300 yards long. There were several pieces of German equipment on the ground nearby and in among the apple trees, but no other sign of enemy soldiers. At this time, Lieutenant Taws came running up and, without knowing the situation before me, told me to get my men over the hedge and get on with the attack. I couldn't understand the great hurry. We had been there only a few minutes, and since we knew the Germans were close, I wanted to check around a little. I just didn't feel safe going into that orchard. About thirty yards to my left was a gate through the hedge into the field just to the left of the orchard, and I asked if we could try that way. He agreed, saying, Get moving right away. 
So we went quickly through the gate and moved ahead, staying close to the hedge that bordered the left side of the orchard. It was a good thing we did, because the Germans had moved to the parallel hedge opposite us across the orchard and would have hit us from the side had we gone right on through from where we'd thrown the grenades. They fired at us with rifles and threw some potato masher grenades, grenades with handles about eight inches long to give leverage to the throw. The small depression behind the hedge gave us cover from the rifle fire, and most of their grenades fell in the orchard or struck tree limbs and never reached us. Of course, we would have been easy targets if we had gone into the orchard. No one was hurt, so we kept on moving along the hedge toward the next cross hedgerow in front. When I looked through this next hedge, I could see some farm buildings about 300 yards ahead and, about a mile farther, another small town, probably Moyen. At this far point in our advance, we were pulled back abruptly. I never did understand why, since the few enemy I could detect ahead did not seem capable of stopping us. We mounted the tanks and went back along the same road we'd advanced along earlier. But when we reached Le Mesnil, Herman, we kept right on going a good four miles to the ruins of the small village Villebaudin, which had been torn apart by a savage battle. Knocked out tanks, German and American, lay all over the place, and some were still burning. Houses had walls knocked down and furniture spilled out. Many homes were totally destroyed. Perhaps we had been intended for reinforcements, but by the time we arrived, the battle was over. I can't say I was disappointed. It was getting late in the day, so we were ordered to set up our defensive positions on the edge of town and spent the next few hours digging our two-man foxholes. Mine was next to a knocked-out Sherman tank. The night was blessedly quiet, without any action in our sector. As I lay in my foxhole, the unexpected calm gave me time to mull over some impressions of combat. At first glance, the Army's infantry training had been very thorough and practical, Yet now that I had some actual battle experience, I had come across some serious gaps in the training. Three incidents during the day had caught me without warning or preparation. First was the fact that while training was based on leading a full-strength unit, in actual combat, I found myself at about half-strength, or less, much of the time. This makes a big difference in tactics, and I was forced to experiment as I went along, and this could have been tragic. Even a little training in understrength deployment would have helped. Two other items I would have liked to have been at least introduced to in advance were how to recognize the onset of mental breakdown and what to do about it and how to replace leaders. My on-the-spot lessons showed me that seeing it happen is much different than simply hearing about it. I was convinced that all soldiers have a physical and emotional limit. The private who stepped in at once as sergeant made me wonder how many others might be able to handle a leader's job if they got the chance or were forced into it. My third day was now over, and I found we still had 19 men left of the original 40, the combat fatigue case being my only loss of the day. Nothing in this world could induce me to go through even a small part of it again. But I think I learned something about myself and about other people. Day four of the saint lo Perrier Breakthrough our battalion was ordered to clear the Germans off a high ridge several miles long running parallel to the villebaudin tessy sur Road. Other units attached to us, and thus making a combat force, were a company of 17 Sherman tanks, each with two 30 caliber machine guns and a 75 mm or 3-inch gun. Supporting us were a platoon of tank destroyers with 50 caliber machine gun and 90 mm gun, plus artillery and mortars, and a cannon company with four 100 money millimeter howitzers. Fortunately for our peace of mind, we had no inkling this routine assignment would turn out to be one of the most disastrous of the entire war. By nightfall, nine of our 17 tanks would be demolished and the infantry would be almost wiped out. Our ruination was the famous German 88, the incredible 80 mm artillery piece. Its power was awesome. A direct hit did not bounce off the sloping four-inch solid steel armor plate front of a Sherman tank. It went clear through and out the back. I saw smoking tanks ripped through from front to back by a single armor-piercing 88. Rarely did any of the crew survive, for along with the shell itself were the ricocheting chunks of tank metal it tore off, not to mention the inevitable concussion and internal bleeding. Fires also made it difficult to rescue the wounded as shells inside exploded from the heat. Tanks were often death traps for the crew 
Rifle Companies F and G led off to the right of the road, probing cautiously toward the top of the ridge. The road had a gradual upward slope for about 500 yards. E Company, minus my platoon, and H Company followed the two lead companies. My platoon trailed the two lead companies, holding about 100 yards to their right rear as protection against a possible flank attack. Suddenly the Germans opened up on the forward rifle companies with rifles, machine guns, mortars, and artillery. The exposed infantry instantly hit the ground and dove for any cover available, returning the fire as soon as they got into position. Our artillery was getting in quite a few rounds also as we could hear it going out over our heads. The calm hillside exploded into a full-scale battle. Quick pinpoint flashes of small arms fire blinked along the bottom of the hedges. The sudden bright flash of bursting shells flowered among the dark green helmeted shapes of the infantry. Worst of all on the nerves was the endless pounding of the noise, the thundering blasts of artillery, and the angry staccato of machine guns. The Germans were close on our right flank, and they were firing just as hard as those on the battalion front. Apparently they had been pushed aside by the battalion's advance, and they stayed out there and let us parade across their front as though it were a shooting gallery. I moved my platoon out to the right behind a thick hedge, along with five tanks and two tank destroyers spaced out alongside my men. We opened fire on the Germans some two hundred yards away, across the flat top of the ridge. They did not let up, but at least we were giving them plenty to keep them busy. Our concentrated fire should have been enough to drive them off the ridge. But one of those sorry accidents of fate turned the tide against us, almost wiping us out. Suddenly, we were caught between two fires, the Germans to our front and our own efficient artillery to the rear. It seems one of the prearranged signals with our artillery backfired. Red smoke was a signal for our artillery to open fire on the smoke. As luck would have it, someone dropped red smoke right on our position. Before we could move, we began to catch hell from our artillery as well as the Germans. Artillery and more tar shells were dropping on us from all sides, and we had no choice but to dive it for cover. Some crawled under the nearest hedge, while others tried to get close to or under tanks to use them as shields. Few things are as terrifying as the target area of an artillery barrage. You cannot think, cannot talk, and there is no place to go. You must fight your instincts to get up and run. All you can do is hang on and hope the shells will miss you or the barrage will end. Tanks and tank destroyers were the exception. They had to move out of there. The tank's overhead hatches had to be closed against the artillery, and that practically blinded the drivers. All they could see through the driver's slits was a narrow horizontal strip directly to the front. There was no view at all of the ground close in front of the tank. The withdrawing tanks thus could not see some of the men on the ground, and the men, because of the overpowering din of the explosions, could not hear the tanks coming. Two of my men were crushed by the maneuvering tanks. I told myself they were already dead from the shelling. Another of the men on the ground next to me was killed instantly by a mortar shell that landed on his back. His buddy and I were splattered with flesh and blood, but were not touched by shrapnel. His body must have absorbed the shell. The survivor broke in panic and ran wildly past me. I tackled him instinctively, but he was a big man, and he dragged me along for a few yards. I managed to hold on and kept talking to him quietly. He quickly regained control, and just about then the barrage ended. While our single medic manfully attended the wounded, I collected the few men still able to stand, and we resumed our positions along the flank. This was typical hedgerow country, with many small hills and gullies and occasional gaps in the hedge. The Germans were on the ridgeline along our course, and they were able to follow our every move. We advanced as carefully as possible while taking cover behind the hedges, hoping they might not spot us. Then we rushed across the gaps. Our tanks kept out of sight below us, coming up to help us only when the hedges were high enough to hide them. At one time, while I was lying on the ground beside one of our tanks, waiting for the men to get into position, I suddenly got the urge to move, and did crawl ahead some ten feet closer to the hedge. There was no purpose in this move, just a compulsion. The next moment, a machine gun cut up the very ground I had just left. What impelled me to move, I'll never know. This life-saving hunch 
might have had the same source as the one I had received just three days before when, for no particular reason, I ordered the already overloaded men to carry extra grenades, those grenades that served us well while we ran the gauntlet, the night the blazing tank lit up the road. Perhaps there is some unknown sense we call upon subconsciously. The main body of the battalion had been forced to stop, and during the breather, I got a chance to take stock. I found I now had six of the original forty men, two of the original five tanks, and both of the tank destroyers. The rest of the battalion was also in rough shape and was almost stripped of officers. I was the only officer left of the original six in E Company. A tank destroyer, incidentally, has tracks and armored sides like a tank, but is completely open at the top. This gives the crew a clear view of the enemy targets, but of course, no overhead protection. The great thing about the TD was its 90 mm gun, the only one we had capable of knocking out the big German Tiger tank and its six inches of armor plate. Our Shermans and their 75s could handle the Mark IV medium German tank, but was no match for the Tiger. The TD was a must on our team. At one time during a lull, I happened to be standing beside a TD, studying the enemy position through my field glasses. The TD captain was doing the same thing from his open turret above me. Suddenly he yelled, Hit the dirt! Instantly my men and I dove for the hedge. An 88 high explosive, she, shell burst on the front of the TD, and its shrapnel flew everywhere. The captain had seen the quick flash with the German gun, and he reacted at once. His shout gave us a split second that probably saved our lives, for the 88 travels faster than sound, and we never would have ducked if he had not yelled. As it was, the shell had exploded only five or six feet from where we lay in the dirt. None of my men was hurt, and I got off with only a splitting headache, and I couldn't hear too well for a few hours. The captain immediately moved his TD back down the hill out of sight, and the other TD and tanks also moved. He was almost in shock from the concussion, but he refused to be evacuated. His TD was not damaged, for it had shed the Chi shell. If the 88 had been loaded with armor-piercing, AP, the TD would have been ripped apart. A few minutes later, a battalion of infantry from another division came up to relieve what was left of our battered battalion. A captain from this new unit came over to me and asked me to fill him in. I pointed across the small open gully ahead to where the front-line riflemen were taking cover behind a hedge and told him the enemy were directly in front of them. I also showed him the hedge on the ridge, 200 yards to our right, where the Krauts could observe our every move and had plenty of machine guns, mortars, artillery, and 88s, and I told him they hit us hard whenever we crossed an open space. Finally, I suggested that, everything considered, the best route for his men to take up to the front-line riflemen would be a short detour to the left, behind a small rise that avoided the open gully. Possibly the captain was preoccupied with other problems, or he didn't completely understand my suggestion, or he might not have seen enough combat to appreciate what the Germans could do. He thanked me politely, then led his men, followed by another company, into the exposed area across the gully. To my astonishment, the Germans did not fire on them, and I began to wonder if they might have pulled out. I quickly found that I, too, had underestimated their shrewdness. They had been watching the new battalion, and they guessed their mission. So as soon as the new rifle companies were mixed in with the companies they were relieving and both were somewhat confused and exposed, the Krauts commenced shelling the entire area with very heavy artillery and mortar fire. They knew the exact range having just withdrawn from that location, and they opened up with all available weapons in a very fierce barrage, right on target. Exploding shells flashed everywhere and raised much dust and smoke. In wild panic, the men dodged about, screaming, and headed for the rear. Their eyes were wild with fright and tears streamed down their contorted faces. They were in complete panic. We stayed in our position on the flank and watched helplessly, our stomachs churning, we watched the desperate officers of the new battalion as they tried frantically to regain control. They stood at gaps in the hedgerow behind us and intercepted their men as they rushed by. We could hear them shouting out where they wanted each company to collect. About half an hour passed, the men milling around in the rear, sorting themselves into companies. During this time, 
They were very vulnerable to further attack, but they were fortunate. In a short time, the shelling tapered off enough to allow vehicles to move. All available ambulances and medical teams moved up to get the wounded taken care of quickly. Every vehicle able to carry a stretcher was used. For over an hour, we watched ambulances, jeeps, light tanks, and half-tracks hauling out those wounded, unable to walk. The Germans also must have been watching, but did not fire again. I found out why later. During all this blasting by the Germans, I saw no return fire at all from our cannon or artillery. Probably all the forward observers or their radios had been knocked out. Our Air Force wasn't around either, but they probably were busy helping Patton's tanks in the breakout. When things began to quiet down and seemed under control, a captain from the battalion staff of this new unit came over and cautioned me that we might be in for a heavy counterattack soon. I agreed, for I had anticipated this very thing. He went on to say that if my men would stay to help, he'd see that we all got hot chow. We then had a total of about 30 men, including the crews of the tanks and TDs and some stragglers from the company. At this point, food of any sort held little interest for us. But since we had no orders to fall back, I told him we would stay until ordered to move. Shortly afterward, a major in a sharp, clean uniform with the 4th Division patch on his shoulder came walking up to me from the rear all alone. He informed me that he was Major Walker, our new battalion commander. He told me briefly and simply that Major Drake had been a casualty in the last barrage. I had never met Major Drake and did not know how or if Lieutenant Colonel Lum Edwards, the commander when I joined the battalion, had become a casualty. Major Walker asked me several questions about the recent action and the enemy location and potential, and I held back nothing, including the warnings about going straight out into the gully. He nodded his understanding, told me to stay in position until further orders, and took off for the front along the route that detoured the gully. I don't know what he found at the front, beyond complete demoralization and no great desire to go get the Esobes, but he quickly gained control. Soon I received orders to follow when he jumped off in the attack and to continue protecting the right flank. My first thought was, what the hell with? The tanks had been moved up to support the attack at the front. There were only the two TDs, plus about a dozen riflemen, six from my original forty, and a few stragglers. I have often wondered if the new battalion CO knew the enemy had withdrawn, and if he did, just how he knew. Was it simply luck? Anyway, it worked, and I was impressed. Later on, we stopped for the night in some fields not far from tessie sur -Ville, digging in along the hedges where we placed our TDs and tanks and other vehicles under the trees to hide them from aerial view. As full darkness settled over us about 11 p.m., we heard occasional German planes overhead. By now, we could distinguish the characteristic sound of enemy planes. Our planes had a steady drone, Theirs was more of a hesitant put-put. As the enemy up there floated around looking for a target, one of our trigger-happy gunners on a 50 caliber quad, four machine guns mounted to fire together from the back of a half-track, opened up. Soon other quads in his unit joined in, with the tracers streaming up into the night sky in a huge arch of ribbons. This cone of tracers didn't touch the planes at all, but did pinpoint our location very neatly. A few minutes later, a solitary Pathfinder plane drifted over us and dropped two brilliant parachute flares, lighting us up brightly, like a football field, so that the night bombers could see us easily. As we looked up nervously through the flares to the sky above, we clearly made out the dark shapes of the bombers, now directly overhead. Our gunners again opened up, shooting through the shredded tin foil the bombers were dropping to mess up our radar. The tracers looked to be way off target, and certainly no planes were hit. It seemed those little parachute flares never would reach the ground, and we were nakedly helpless in their eerie glare. We were down on our hands and knees, pressing against the earth with mouths open to reduce the effects of concussion and fingers in our ears as the bombs whistled down. As the whistling shriek of the free-falling bombs ended just over the hedge, we were utterly defenseless. We were in the bottom of an elevator shaft, awaiting the crash of a runaway elevator cage. There was nowhere we could go. A couple of 500-pound bombs hit just over the hedge, about 30 yards away, 
and I was knocked flat in the dirt. For an instant, I was in the eye of a tornado with the air crushed from my lungs. My head was whirling and pounding, and I gasped for breath. I tried to stand up, but my legs sagged, and I collapsed. Suddenly it was over. After a short while, most of my senses returned, and I checked my men. They were shaken and frightened as I had been, but no one was wounded. A medical unit had the rotten luck to be in the field next to us, and they lost several ambulances and many of their men. The rest of the night passed quietly, and for this we were immensely grateful. Around noon the next day we were pulled out of the line. Our part in the St. Lowe breakthrough was over. A company was down to about 27 men out of the original 168. Only six of us survived from the original 40 of our platoon. I was very lucky to have survived my first major battle. We were told, officially, that we had accomplished our mission. Later, the 22nd Infantry received the Presidential Unit Citation for its part in the St. Lowe breakthrough. General Patton had been able to swing through the gate we had opened in the German line at St. Lowe and began a big circling drive to capture a whole German army. Combat Team A, made up of the 22nd Infantry and the 66th Regiment of the 2nd Armored, also known as Task Force Rose, after General Rose of the 2nd Armored Division, has done its job well. Now a new phase of the war was possible. Our troops were no longer confined to the small beachhead stymied by crisscrossing walls of hedgerows. Now every unit was needed for a new role, pursuit of the Germans across France. We were ordered to rejoin the other two regiments of the 4th Infantry Division on the road to saint pois Somewhere en route we stopped for the night. I fell asleep, so exhausted that I was not aware of the heavy rain falling. It was close to dawn when I awoke, stiff and cold and wet, with about five inches of water in my foxhole. Somehow our young bodies were able to endure such punishment. The St. Lowe breakthrough was completed by August 2nd, and the enemy was occupied with Patton's tanks, so we had time to stop and take on new officers and men. Lieutenant Tolles was our new commanding officer in E Company. Lieutenant Pizarak had returned after a head wound and resumed command of the 1st Platoon. I had the 2nd Platoon, and Lieutenant Bloom had the 3rd Platoon. A. Lieutenant Lloyd was brought up to lead the Weapons Platoon. Platoon Sergeant Reed was back with me, although I don't know where he had been, and Sergeant Anders was returned from special patrol work. The newly minted Sergeant Fearson had survived and was still with us. We received enough replacements to bring the platoon back up to 40 men. With the sergeants and about four other men, plus myself, we now had eight experienced men. All the rest were green recruits. Meanwhile, Patton's Third Army stormed through the gap and raced wildly in three different directions, westward toward the great port city of Brest, in a northerly circle to help trap two German armies, and straight east to the Seine near Paris. Our rest and replacement period was a short two days. We were moved along the route toward saint pois and assigned to clear up some pockets of German resistance and defend against possible penetration by the enemy. One night, as we took up defensive positions along a ridge facing east toward no man's land, I felt very vulnerable because our men had to dig in so far apart. I checked my platoon area several times during the night and found several errors the new men were making. One stands out as a major error to this day. I found one man sitting on top of a hedgerow with no cover around him. He stood out vividly long before I got near him. I showed him how to take advantage of a big tree in its shadow, which was only ten feet from his exposed position. I told him to think and thus avoid giving a Jerry an easy opportunity to kill him. Our next objective was the village of St. Poi. As we approached along the road, in an attempt to make the Jerrys take cover, and thus lose some of their advantage, our artillery began to lay down a barrage on both the village of St. Pois and the ridge behind it. The infantry then started to move up. Our company was not in the lead this time, so we missed the fighting, but we did catch some incoming artillery. Also, one of our jeeps ran over a big anti-tank mine and was destroyed. When we got into St. Pois, our company was ordered to go house to house on the right side of the road. We took only a few prisoners, for most of the Germans had withdrawn. Much to the delight of our men, we did find quite a bit of hard cider. 
Because of impurities in the drinking water, native Frenchmen do not drink water unless it is boiled. Instead, they settle for wine or cider. After two weeks of steady fighting, our men were glad enough to have a taste of it. The cider barrels we came across were used as reservoirs, lying on their sides. They measured eight feet in height and twelve feet in length, and almost filled the small barn that stored them. My platoon had one casualty in St. Poi, Sergeant James Chick Reed, who was hit in the upper thigh by a rifle bullet. Sergeant Otha Anders moved up to platoon sergeant. We continued our advance in the wake of Patton's Third Army. Near Mortain, the Germans were making a desperate attempt to break our line behind Patton's tanks and cut his supply lines. Here they ran into the 30th Infantry Division, which at one point was using its artillery like rifles, firing low-level point-blank shots at German tanks and infantry. Artillery fired in a direct line instead of a long arc is very effective. When the enemy is close enough to fire in this manner, the gunners can usually see the targets, and this allows them to fire directly into the mass or at tanks. All that shrapnel really tears up the enemy. Of course, it also gives the Germans a good chance to knock out your guns, and their crews as well, if they can get in close enough. The enemy can see the artillery and direct all kinds of fire on the guns. It takes a lot of guts for the artillery crew to man their pieces when in such exposed positions. The exposure often requires the men to fight like infantry. They are better suited for long-range action, but that time it worked for us. The combined infantry and artillery fire was too much for the Germans, and they withdrew with many casualties. During the German attacks on the 30th Division, my platoon was sent out to support a couple of anti-tank guns at a roadblock. The officer who came out to relay the order told me very little. As we were in enemy territory, I thought I should know more about the roadblock, such as its exact location, how long we might be gone, and how much food and ammunition to take along. He refused to tell me anything except to get moving. I obeyed reluctantly. I could smell alcohol on the officer's breath, and I resented having to take orders from someone even slightly drunk. The roadblock assignment turned out to be an easy one, for no enemy appeared. The desperate German counterattack at Mortain had failed, but we were held in the area a few more days before we began a series of shuttle movements by truck toward the Seine River. With our new orders, keep your eyes open, but keep moving. The chase was in full swing. Our infantry rode trucks through Alençon and Chartres, stopping only to refuel or to clear out pockets of the enemy. The trucks were from service companies, and each had two black drivers. As though we didn't have enough problems on our hands, yet another one, albeit minor enough, cropped up. The driver's orders were for both of them to ride in the cab. Our orders were for either an officer or a sergeant to ride up front to make sure the trucks did not get lost. The drivers were very upset by our orders, and some refused to obey. Some officers had to pull a gun to settle the conflict in orders. I had no problem with my drivers, though they did grumble. By now, the bulk of the German armies was trapped by the combined Allied armies. British and Canadian armies were crushing down from the north to meet two American armies driving up from the south. This maneuver became known as the Falaise Gap. Worst of all for the Germans caught in this pocket must have been the annihilating bombing and strafing by Allied planes then in complete control of the skies. Thousands of Germans nonetheless made their escape toward the Seine. The dead Germans were literally stacked by the hundreds, in some places two and three feet deep. It was a real massacre. All of the roads for miles were strewn with German corpses and littered with hundreds of smoking or burning tanks, trucks, and wagons. The debris of the fleeing Germans was everywhere. Hulks of burned-out tanks, trucks, half-tracks, and self-propelled and towed guns were dramatic proof of the devastating power of airplanes. My feeling of utter helplessness during the brief bombing a few nights earlier made me realize what must have been absolute terror and total panic for the German soldier under the deluge of destruction from our air force. Large foxholes had been dug by the enemy all along the road, ready for instant use. The strafing and bombing planes gave the retreating Germans no rest. The ability of German supply forces to get food and ammunition to their armies had been obliterated. 
I imagine the German truck drivers were always looking for the next foxhole they might dive into, if strafed. The combination of our devastating ground tactics and our superior air forces had almost totally destroyed two of Germany's best armies in less than a month. I wonder if the Air Force ever received enough credit for its awesomely effective job. One can only speculate how many infantry lives the Air Force saved. For all that, I am willing to admit that I always resented the extra pay and comfortable living of the Air Force boys. I am now prepared to declare my deepest, most profound appreciation for the work they did and for the incredible risks they took every time they were in the air. We were in a war that was coming at us from all sides, from the front, from the rear, from the flank, from the ground up if we happened to step on a mine, or from the air, from bombs, strafing, and artillery of all sorts. Our rest was in a foxhole with a helmet for a pillow. The foxhole was considered our furnished quarters, so the Army did not allow us our forty dollars, a month quarter's allowance. Such is the life of the infantry. We rode big six-by-six six trucks day and night. After dark, the truck column was blacked out except for cat's-eye slits in their lights, which were so dim the weary drivers could hardly make out the truck ahead. Combat military police were at some of the road junctions directing traffic. On one of the quick turns, my driver's reactions were too slow, and we careened into the ditch, breaking the front left spring and tearing the front axle loose. When the last of the convoy wheeled past, we found ourselves all alone in a private no-man's land. I posted guards, and the rest of us tried to get some sleep. The driver crawled under the truck, but he was too scared to sleep. Around sunup, a big maintenance truck hooked onto us and dragged us to an orchard where a maintenance crew began repairs. We were ready to roll again at noon, and the crew captain let me study his map for the route the 4th Infantry Division had taken. I made some notes, and we headed out by ourselves. I told our driver we had to catch the division before dark, or we'd be camping out again by ourselves. I never knew a two-and-a-half-ton truck could move so fast. That driver, with tires screeching, wheeled us around curves and bounced us through village after village. We ripped across open country until, just before dark, we caught the division. It had stopped to gas up and some of the trucks were already moving out as we arrived. We quickly tanked up, grabbed some rations and water, and found our place back in the column. Rumors began to come alive. The most exciting was that we were going to bypass Paris. None of the junior officers really knew what was going on. We could only listen to our seniors and use our imaginations. One morning, about the third week of August, we were ordered up to West Bank of the Seine, some twenty miles from Paris. We were in the Arpajon Corbet area. It seems that one of our other battalions had tried to cross the river in twelve man pontoon boats under the screen of fog, and about two thirds of the way across, the fog had lifted and left the battalion helpless. Most of the boats had been sunk, and many of the men lost, hit by direct fire from twenty millimeter anti aircraft guns that were based on the other bank. Rapid fire anti aircraft artillery makes a very effective weapon for sinking small boats on a swift river. It was a disaster. Very few of the men made it back to shore. The men had carried a lot of heavy equipment, and the current was swift, so only those able to shed their equipment quickly had been able to escape. With a precedent like that, we were not too crazy about our assignment, as it was now our turn. We gladly waited for the engineers to bring up more boats, and meanwhile our mortars and artillery blasted away at the other bank. We could clearly see the German gunners abandon their guns and run back over the hill. The Seine at that point was still very large and deep enough to allow ocean-going freighters, which meant it was at least twenty feet deep. The current was frightening much too fast for our flat, square-nosed boats. We were told the current was nine miles per hour, good jogging speed, but to us, it looked much, much faster. Soon my platoon was loaded, twelve to a boat, and we took off, paddling like mad for the east bank. The wild current swept us a couple hundred yards downstream, and every moment we braced for some kind of enemy fire as we paddled hard for shore. This time, all the luck in the world was with us for there was no opposition from the Krauts. Our artillery and mortars had completely routed the German AA gunners. We hit the east bank without a loss. We quickly pushed straight ahead inland to the high ground a half mile ahead. 
As soon as that position was denied to enemy observation, our engineers began to build a pontoon bridge, a frustrating, if not impossible, job. As soon as they set up a section, it was swept away by the powerful current. Soon they were running out of pontoons, and something had to be done. It seems an older Frenchman, a retired World War I naval captain, had been watching interestedly, and he now came forward and told me he probably could help if I could lend him about 20 men. His idea involved three ships that happened to be moored on the east bank directly across from the pontoon bridge. The plan was to release the huge ropes on the downstream ship's stern, letting it swing out across the river as a kind of gate to slow down the river enough to get the pontoons assembled across it. Carefully following the old captain's able directions in English, my men wound the big ropes around the dock snubbers and a few trees. The swift current eased the ship's stern out until it was straight across the river, slowing the current just enough. The engineer's sectional spans began to settle in place, and soon the bridge was complete, the first tank rumbled across. I was sure those engineers would not soon forget that French naval captain and his ingeniously simple strategy. Now that the bridge was in place and the east bank secured, we were no longer needed there. So we walked back on the bridge to the west bank. We did not know it at the moment, but our next stop would be Paris.